Okay, welcome back to the second half of today's session on series circuits. And what I'd like to do now is lead into the next segment, which really shows us one of the more practical applications of a series circuits. And this is known as voltage dividers. So what is the purpose of a voltage dividers? Well, think of a scenario where typically what we've seen is our basic circuit has a power supply, then we have some resistors and maybe we have another, um, let's say a light bulb and we want to turn on the light bulb and, th and that's all we want to do. So that's a very basic circuit. But the idea here is that we have only one power supply. What would happen if, in addition to the light bulb, we wanted to attach another device to the circuit? But however, this new device doesn't want 24 volts. We might need another voltage. Maybe this other device only needs 12 volts. Well, we don't want to just go out and get another power supply because generally power supplies are, are expensive. So one way around, around that problem is to design a simple voltage divider using resistors in series. So by doing that, we are able to provide different voltages to different parts of the circuit as may be required. These type of configurations are known as voltage dividers. So let's take a look at what a simple voltage divider might look like. So here's an example of one. And um, we're going to see what this equation that we call the voltage divider equation. Before talking about the equation itself, let's look at how we can actually construct a voltage divider. So again, I apologize for this slide. It's not particularly, particularly clear. Let me see if our next slide is, makes it a little bit clearer, maybe not. Okay, let's look at this and we'll work with this one here. Um, notice point number one here. It says the voltage drop across any given resistors in a series circuit is equal to the ratio of that resistor to the total resistance multiplied by the voltage source. So let's look at this circuit for a moment and see what's going on here. And then we'll look at the equation. You see that we have a voltage supply here, a battery, Vs. This is our battery source. And it's connected in series to a bunch of resistors, R1, R2, R3, and we can go all the way up to whatever, however many we want, Vn. And then we come back to the set of the battery. So what is interesting about this configuration is that each one across each one of these resistors, we have a certain amount of voltage drop. And that amount of voltage drop is given by the equation that we saw earlier, V, in this case, VR1, the voltage drop across resistor one, would be equal to, I'll write it here, V1. Well, we're going to see the, the formula in one moment, so let me just hold off on that. The point is we're, we get a different voltage. V1 is different than supply voltage. Likewise, if we have a different resistor here, here for R2, we would get the voltage drop across R2 
if it's different than R1, would be the voltage drop in R2 would be different than V1, which is also different than the supply voltage, and so on. So we can put in another resistor and get a different voltage over here. And we can do that as many times as we want. So now if we come along and say, if, if for example, we had a voltage drop here of four volts, then the voltage we would see here would be Vs minus V1. No, I, let me do that again. Let me. The voltage drop we see here would be the voltage that we see across resistor one. So this would be V1. And if we were to look at across R2, we would get V2. So if we connect a device here, we would see V2. If we connect a device here, we would see V1. <clears throat> Which would lead us to what we call the voltage divider principle. And the formula for computing these voltages in a voltage divider is given by this general formula. So the voltage drop for any one of the resistors equals the value of the resistor divided by the total resistance, so that's the ratio of the resistance, multiplied by the supply voltage. This is known as the voltage divider formula or equation. Let's see how we put that into practice. I'll come back to this slide in a moment. So here's an example. Let's look at example one and see how this, the practicality of this. So in circuit number one, we have a battery, 10 volts for our supply. And of course, our circuit goes like this. So these are actually connected because they both go to ground, which is connected to the negative side of the terminal. That's how that circuit is complete. But what, so we have a V1 here. What is V1? And V2. So we can use the voltage divider principle to do that calculation. Tori, that's correct. Good job. So let's have a look at this. We would use the voltage divider principle here. So if we wanted to do V1, we would write that formula we just saw earlier. V1 equals R1 divided by RT, the total resistance in the circuit. And all of that is multiplied by the supply voltage. So we would have here, R1 in this case is 100 ohms. The total resistance, these are in series, so we just add them up. 100 plus 56 is 156 ohms. And if we multiply this ratio, resistance ratio times the supply voltage, which is 10 volts. You punch that into your calculator and you should get 6.41. Likewise, we would do the same thing for V2. And if you go through the calculation, you should get V2 at 3.59. So that means that if, for our example, want to drive another device here that requires about 
six and a half volts, I can just put it here, connect it from this point and this point like this and connect my device over here. I'll call it device number one. And this device would be looking at 6.41 volts. If I wanted another device to be connected here, and I'm gonna call this device number two, this device would be looking at 3.59 volts. And this one would go to this guy. So from 10 volts, and if we want something that is looking at 10 volts, we just could connect from here, of course, to here. And this is device three. This would be 10 volts. So that is the idea behind voltage divider. We can take the supply voltage and break it down so we can provide additional voltage sources to wherever we might need it. These are very practical applications, very much, very commonly done in a lot of our electronic gadgets that we have and use every day. So they can, you know, it makes no sense to have more than one battery in an electronic gadget. But if we need to drop the voltage for any reason, we would put in a simple voltage divider and make that voltage available to another device that needs that particular voltage. So again, I encourage you to look at these other examples. Here's example two. This one has one, two, three resistors. So there's three additional voltage sources available. And this one has another configuration as well, whoops. So have a look at all of these and be comfortable that you can do them. I have a question from Parsa. Parsa, go ahead. What is your question? Yeah, uh, so what is the difference between the voltage we get here and the voltage we got using the I times R from the Uh, is my voice helping? Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, I, can you repeat? I didn't hear you clearly. Okay, I'm gonna say. Uh, what is the difference between the voltage we get here and the voltage we got using the I times R formula? Uh, those you're talking about use. So right here, you notice that we do not know the curve. So you would not be able to use v, uh, V1 equals IR1. So we can, with this formula in this example, we can calculate the voltage here without knowing the current. And we can calculate the voltage here without knowing the current. If you knew the current, if, if you know this, then you can do V1 equals I R1. There's no difference. Does that help? Yeah, you can do that. You can also, Alex says you can, um, you can find RT. You can't find RT. You can find I, and then you can go ahead and do that. But remember, a lot of times we're not looking at just one simple circuit like this. We might be looking at something very elaborate, very sophisticated, and you may not want to go looking for I if you don't need it. So there's is another way you can do things. Okay, all right, good questions. Thank you for those. So let's move forward. Now, I want to take a little more time to talk about ground. Uh, I know some students get sometimes confused with the notion of ground. So let's spend a few minutes to talk about it and let's try to make clarify in our minds what we mean when we're talking about ground. 
So first of all, let's understand that when we talk about ground, circuit ground, it is, it is a reference point or a common point, some people call it, on the circuit where the voltage at that point is zero. Okay, so it, it tells us right here, reference ground or common defines zero volts of the circuit. And then some people get diff confused with the term earth ground. Well, earth ground is, I mean, it's still used today. I'm not going to say it's no longer used. But it's an older term. And earth ground comes from, you know, back in the old days, a um, long time ago, we would, uh, for example, um, if you were living out in a, in a field in the middle of a farm somewhere, and there were lightning strikes overhead, and if you want to ground, you want to make sure you want to protect your home, you put a rod, maybe you put a, like an antenna on top of, of the roof, the home, you take the antenna with a big cable, you connect it to uh, a post, which you drive into the ground. So when the lightning bolt would strike this antenna on top of the roof, it would go through the conductor wire into the pole, into the ground, and it would dissipate all that energy into the ground. That's kind of the same idea for circuit boards, we need a ground plane on every circuit. Typically, we use the negative side of the, of the battery. And I'll show you that in a moment, but what, what, what we mean. But keep in mind, earth ground was typically used when we actually connect a ground post right into the ground. Now, think about how practical would that be for your cell phone? If you had to put a, a metal post into the ground and it had to be connected to your cell phone, that wouldn't be very practical. It wouldn't be very mobile. In our cell phone, so we don't use earth ground, but we use a ground for the circuit. And what we mean by ground for the circuit is the point where that is deemed to be zero volts for that particular circuit. So let's look at this simple circuit schematic here. Now, notice that we have a battery, our supply voltage is here, 12 volts. And in this case, we have a light bulb over here. When, so ground in this case is shown to be connected to the negative side of the battery, right here. And when you see this, this, all, and it's not connected, but because this is ground and this is ground, these points are common, they're the same. So for clarity, most circuits are drawn like, we don't put this here we would just connect this here. So there's just one ground connection. But if you think of the labs you do in your, um, you, the circuits you do in your labs, you probably can connect to that terminal, that ground terminal on your breadboard at different locations, different holes on your board, and they're all connected underneath to the same ground plane. So the point here is that this is connected to the negative side of the battery, which is zero volts. So anything that is connected here directly to this, I don't care where it is, anything that's connected to this 
side of the battery is zero volts. The battery, battery is 12 volts. So if I were to put, let's say, a point here, and I call this point A, let me just clean this up. And I call this point A here. And I call this point B. And let me say I call this point C. And let me call this point D, just for the for this ex example. So what is the voltage at of point D? I'm going to call that VD. Well, VD is connected to ground. Good. Some of you are chiming in and saying zero. That is correct. VD equals zero because it's connected to the negative side of the battery. But what is VC? VC also equals zero because it's also connected to the negative side of the battery. Good. Now, what is VA? Well, if this is zero, the battery gives us 12 volts, so VA is gonna be 12 volts. Good. I see a few of you are chiming in with the correct answers, very good. What is VB? Well, there's no voltage drop from A to B, so VB equals VA. It's also 12 volts. However, there's a voltage drop here. And that voltage drop is 12 volts. So this 12, we drop 12, we go to zero. Okay, keep that in mind because the next slide will help clarify some concepts. Let's take a look at this uh, circuit over here. So here's an actual circuit. Here's our battery. Again, plus, this is the negative side of the battery. It's a 12 volt battery. It's a 12 volt battery. And this is negative. So we have three points. Point A here. Point B right here and point C right here. What is, when we say VA, first of all, let's understand some terminology. When you see something like this, this means what is the voltage at point A relative to ground? Now, where is ground on this circuit? We don't show ground on this, or do we show it? Yeah, it's, the ground is shown right here. Okay? So what is the, the voltage at A relative to ground, which is connected to the negative side of the battery, as you can see? Well, the battery puts in 12 volts, so VA equals to 12. Now, what happens with R1 at R1? You see it's 5K, R2 is 10K. Apologize for the, the clarity of the slide again. So um, VA we said was 12. What happens here? We have a voltage drop here, VR1. How much, what is the voltage drop of VR at R1? Well, we can just use that voltage divider formula, which says R1 over RT times Vs. And in this case, R1 is five, K divided by RT, which is 5 plus 10, is 15K 
times the voltage, which is 12 volts. So that's one third, so this is four volts. So VR1 is four volts. That means going through this resistor, we drop four volts. So what, how much are we gonna have at point B? If I were to say, what is VB? Correct. Those of you who are saying eight, you are correct. How do we get VB? Well, the voltage of B, this means the voltage of B relative to ground. Remember, ground is zero, zero volts. Well, we had 12 here. We lose four here, so this must be eight. And what happens at resistor two? Well, we have to do VR2 equals, in this case, it would be 10K or R2 over 15K times 12 volts. So this is two thirds, so that gives us eight volts. So this would be the drop of eight volts here. So we have eight, what would be VC? It would be eight minus the voltage drop here, which is eight volts, gives us zero. Which conforms, by the way, to Kirchhoff's voltage law, which we saw earlier. Okay, uh, Ali asks us what would happen to point C if we connect point B to ground? That's a good question, Ali. Just wait one more slide and we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> now, just for the sake of clarity, you see here, uh, when we say VA, that means the voltage of A with respect to ground, VB. Voltage of B with, at B with respect to ground. If we see something like VAB, that means what is the voltage of A with respect to B? And so the voltage of A with respect to B is the same as saying right here we show it. It's the same as saying VA minus VB. Remember, VA was 12. VB, we said, was 8. So VAB would be 12 minus 8, which gives us 4 volts. And that would be VA relative to VB. We take a voltage reading in here, we would see four volts. All right, let's go ahead one more slide and try to answer Ali's question. <clears throat> let's look at these scenarios here, and I think this will help you understand what happens. First of all, we want to remember this. The ground point does not affect the current in the circuit, number one. And number two, it does not affect the voltage drops across the resistors. That means in any circuit, wherever you put your ground point, doesn't affect the current and it doesn't affect the voltage drops. These are absolute values. They happen. It doesn't matter where the ground is. Ground is a relative term. So let's clarify that by looking at some examples. Here's our first example. This is the way most of your circuits look like. 
and the way we typically show them. I would say, you know, 99% of the times, this is the way they are shown. We have a voltage supply, 12 volts. We have a plus and a minus, and we see that the ground terminal is connected to the negative side of the battery. So this point represents zero volts, which is what we have here, zero volts. And on this side, we know that the battery puts in at 12 volts, so we have 12 volts here. Right here, 12 volts. And we continue to have 12 volts until there is a voltage drop. So the first voltage drop occurs right here. How many volts are going to be dropped through resistor 1? Looking at this, you should be able to calculate that. Good. Matthew, Matthias, you see that this is 1. The total is 1 plus 1 plus 1. So the ratio here is one third. So one third of 12 is four. So we're going to drop four volts here. If we drop four volts here, on the other side of the resistor, we have 12 minus four, which is eight. We're going to drop another four volts here. So on this side of resistor, we have eight minus four. We're left with four. We're going to drop another four volts here. 4 minus 4 gives us, leaves us 0. Again, satisfies that Kirchhoff's voltage law. Jonathan says, can there be volts in the circuit if the resistors are low distance? The answer is no. As you put a lower resistance, you would have a higher current. And when you have, you still multiply voltage times current, you still get the voltage drop. I mean, voltage times resist, current times resistance, you still get the same voltage drop. Remember, voltage drop is absolute. All right, let's look at our next example. Let's look at what happens here. Look at what we did here. We said, okay, let's put our ground point over here. What is the definition of ground? This is the point where V equals zero. So if we're putting in 12 volts here from our battery, what would VD be? And the answer that should jump out at you is V equals VD equals minus 12. Because 12 minus 12 plus 12 gives me your zero. Now you can look at that in another way. So if this is our ground now attached to the positive side of the battery and that we're saying that this is V equals zero here, because that's the definition for our ground. How much did we say we're dropping in our one? Four volts. So what would be the voltage at VB? Zero minus four would give us minus four volts. How much do we drop at R2? Another four volts. Minus four minus four gives us minus eight. We drop four more volts here. Minus eight, minus four gives us minus 12 at VD. We come through our battery, we add 12, that still gives us zero. Kirchhoff's voltage law. We saw it earlier and we said, somebody asked me, and we said that what, another way of expressing it is that zero equals Vs minus 
all the voltage drops. Excellent. Let's look at our last scenario, which may be a little more, even more confusing. In this case, here's our batteries. You could think of this as one battery if you want. It's still 12, but we can show it as two pieces if we want. And we happen to put the ground right in the center here. So this is our zero point, V at the right here equals zero. So on this side, we're adding six volts. So this is VA equals to six. Remember here, we dropped four. So six minus four gives us two at point B. We drop another four here. So two minus four gives us minus two at point C. We drop another four here. So minus two plus four minus four gives us minus six at point D. We add six with our second cell and that adds up to zero again. All right, so that's the more in-depth look at ground. Now, Jonathan has a question. He says, how does the electricity know there's, there's ground? Because the wires are made out of metal and circuit ground is made out of metal too, right? Yes, they're both made out of that metal. The only way electricity flows is based on potential difference. As long as there is a potential difference in your circuit, current is going to flow. There's a potential difference between this point and this point. There's a potential difference between this point and this point. Okay? So remember, what is a battery? You got to think of it like a, a a pressure source that pushes the flow of electrons or the flow of electricity along a wire back to the origin. And the flow is from current. Um, the convention that we use is that current flows from the plus side to the negative side. So we start here, there's a potential difference. There's 12 volts here, there's zero volts here. So there's a big pressure difference. So it's gonna push the electricity around, if you wanna think of it that way. And it just keeps going, because this difference is always there. This battery is always there, until the battery starts to, we say, in plain English, it has no juice left. When it has no juice left, this potential difference doesn't exist anymore, so it can't push any more current through the circuit. Okay, so I hope that helped by your... Ali asks, does ground have resistance? Ideally, ground has no resistance. Okay, that's the short answer. All right, the last thing I want to kind of point out to you, the last slide here, is um, how to calculate power in series resistors, in series circuits. So in series circuits, First of all, remember that power equals voltage times current. Now, there are some other forms of equations that we're going to learn for power. So you can substitute uh, 
these terms to get other expressions for power, which we will see later. But for now, just keep in mind that power is expressed as voltage times current. And to find the total power in a series circuit, we just add all the individual powers. So if we look at this particular example here, we have a voltage, we have a resistance, of R1, 470, R2, 330. This is in series. So we can calculate, using the voltage divider principle, we can calculate V1, which is this much, and we can calculate V2, which is this much. Now, you could either calculate um, IT here and multiply it by these two to get the total. Another format of P, which is V squared divided by R. And that's the one that is being shown over here. So P1 equals V squared which is this, squared over 470, which is R1, and that gives you 0.29 watts. Remember, power is measured in watts. And P2, we take V2 squared, which is this, divided by R2, and that gives us 0.21 watts. And then we, to get the total, we add the two, and that's the total power dissipated by this circuit. <coughs> the, the, there is also another formula for power, and we'll look at that another time. I just want to point out one more slide here. Uh, when we have a power supply, we usually represent it like this. We say, here's our power supply. Let's say this is 12 volts. And if we think of it as an ideal power supply, the assumption we make is that the power supply has no internal resistance. You see here, we say the ideal power supply has no internal resistance. So we don't even take it into consideration. They say it's zero. However, the rea reality is that all power supplies have some internal resistance. So the true representation really looks like this. We have a voltage source, 12 volts, and it has a small internal resistance designated by RS, or some people like to designate it as, another way of doing it is RI, or internal. Now, for most, also I want to say for most practical applications, this is ignored because it is very small. You can see here, say typically, for most practical DC sources, the internal resistance is only 50 ohms or somewhere around there. This is an approximation. So I'm going to say here approximately. So for most circuits, 50 ohms is very low. If it were high for the circuit that you're looking at, then you have to consider it into your calculation. So I, I would say if you're, the total resistance in the circuit is like one mega ohm, well, you can ignore this. It doesn't have a very much effect 
if the total resistance in the circuit is only 100 ohms, well, then we need to consider this because 50 ohms is a big factor compared to 100 ohms. It's 50%, so you cannot ignore it. So there's a third image here that typically, and unless you are told otherwise, it is okay to assume that our, our voltage source is ideal. So if you set it to 12, like your power supply that you use in your lab, you can assume that it's gonna give you 12 all the way through. But keep in mind that the practical one, practical power supplies actually drop a little bit as you increase the, the current draw in your circuit. Or as, let me phrase that a different way, which is more precise. As you change your resistance, increase it, or as you increase your current, it tends to drop a little. Your, volt, your current I, starts to drop off very small, but it does. So we're not too concerned about this for our applications. We're gonna be treating most likely like this, unless you're told to take this into consideration. Okay, um, I'm out of time. There's a few slides here that will help you how to do some of your lab stuff. You can certainly inquire with, if you have questions on those with your lab instructor, they'll be happy to show you how to take those measurements if you're still not familiar. And at the end, there's a little, a short quiz here, a couple of questions. Again, I encourage you to work through these to make sure that you're comfortable. And a reminder that there's more self-study exercises on Blackboard, which I also encourage you to take a look at. I have posted the answers there for you, so you should be able to come derive those answers. And if you do, then you should be fairly confident that you have a good handle on the materials that are being discussed. So that's it for today. Are there any final questions? All right, let me stop recording on this particular.